Okay, good evening everybody. I'm not sure if I 100% agree with the organizer's policy to keep the very last and best presentation, the best presentation for the last, but given the fact that you're all still here, it's probably not that uh, bad of a, of a policy. Uh, I will try to do my best uh, to make sure you're not wasting your time here. And hello, Dila. Nice to see you. <laughs> um, for the past 13 years, I've been working with NGOs and academic institutions to help them to put their um, academic research and their digital objects online and accessible for free. I've been doing that together with a team of uh, 28 people of Admire. We are a spin-off of the KU Leuven University. And um, just in yeah, respect to our hosts, uh, ULB, ULB and KU Leuven are both uh, two very uh, good, respectable uh, universities. Um, in my talk today, I will first. Um, it's a, I was a little bit afraid that Emily was going to say practically 100% of what I'm going to bring to you. So it, there's a little bit of overlap, but I will also comment a little bit on the state of academic publication today. Before then, talking about uh, the DSpace community and institutional repositories and how they uh, fit into this uh, picture. And the last part, that's the part that is a little bit technical, but I don't go into detail too much is how the DSpace community, as a mature community, um, how they currently tackle a very big uh, overhaul of uh, discontinuing two existing UIs and introducing a new UI to replace uh, the two uh, legacy ones. But first, because it's been such a long day, um, I know that maybe all of those papers and all the information is, is kind of a blur when you're back in your rooms or hotel rooms uh, tonight, is that if, if I just want to give you one idea to take away today is that everybody in the room or everybody, not uh, us at Meyer, but everybody here really has the potential to accelerate scientific progress just by contributing to getting the results of scientific research, both positive and negative, into the hands of more people uh, quicker and the speed uh, there um, compared to researchers who are just in their lab trying to make their claim and their scope as big as possible and just sit on their data for years that's uh, just something that makes me uh, makes me cry so but it's it's a very difficult trade-off so currently in that communication of results how fast are we already going today or so what's the what's the state of the art um, Let's take you back to the, the pre-internet age where the publishers basically had a marginal cost to print an issue of a journal and also take the distribution cost to get these journals out to the libraries. Um, yeah, in that kind of marginal cost scenario, they, they currently don't have that anymore because uh, due to the internet, it, it can go uh, a, lot, uh, a lot faster than, uh, than what it was then. Um, also, yeah, that I also wanted to mention, in that old model, authors didn't have to pay to get their research published, but also, as it is today, authors didn't get paid to um, send their research into the, the copyright of the publishers, neither. And the publishers made their margins or they recovered their costs by selling the subscriptions to the, to the libraries. When I go online today, and especially when we are uh, looking at this threatening uh, development of the, the coronavirus, I see uh, prestigious journals and publishers making their content uh, available for free, apparently also instantly. So if we think about the, um, the, the discussions that we had about the review, apparently The Lancet has pages on there, uh, Elsevier has pages on there, so somehow they have found the time to review or to make sure that the, uh, th this content is accessible online, which is an, an amazing development and kind of makes me wonder like, okay, we're there, the problem is solved, and it's even solved due to the generous help of the publishers, those benevolent actors in our, um, uh, in our space. But let me ask you this before I continue. Uh, can you raise your hands if you know somebody today who has been diagnosed with the coronavirus? Anybody already? It would be kind of scary. 
<laughs> but can you now raise your hands if you know somebody who's been diagnosed with a form of cancer? It's a lot more people. So when I want to read this uh, recent article, February, so it's a very recent article in clinical oncology, and if I'm not privileged to be on the network of an institution that pays for this, then I need to pay uh, $40 for an article. And if you're approaching this as somebody who has a family member who's affected, um, my point of view is always like, look, it's only when I get to the PDF that I can assess whether it's relevant or interesting in my case. So I kind of want to look at maybe 100 of these PDFs and maybe one of them will, will contain something useful. So it's totally not, um, not, not helping me or, or helping people who, uh, who don't have uh, an institutional subscription. But when I go to the page of this journal, it actually says immediately under the, the title of the journal, it says supports open access. And then I click on it and they say that support actually means that we allow authors the privilege to pay for, uh, uh, to pay an article publishing charge. So basically we as the publisher, we, we do open access and closed access. And if you as an author don't take the paid open access option, then you're the bad guy who doesn't want to set your article free. That wouldn't really be a problem if these uh, fees were like $50 or maybe a couple of hundred dollars. But in, in some of the journals, it's like thousands, thousands of dollars for an article. And I was very happy to hear that that journal of um, open source software said that they don't charge either the author and also not the reader. So that, that's great. So we're kind of in this, in this weird hybrid mode. If I um, access a, a page like this, uh, just uh, Googling, hitting this page that I, uh, as a reader, I don't understand why for, for article Y, there's like a green button says open access, I can download it. Then there's one that I can pay. It's not even tied to the, to the identity of the journal anymore. So um, the question on whether we have solved the problem or not, I think there's still a space where uh, improvements can be made. And um, one example, and I took the screenshot a couple of days ago, but apparently now there's, uh, there's already, I think, hundreds of results in uh, BioArchive, which is an example of a preprint server where that preprint culture in uh, some academic disciplines is really catching on. But the same as the, the comments of the question of these people before of, yeah, I wish we could do longer reviews to get to a higher quality is that I just saw a tweet from this afternoon, is that the people from BioArchive, they have actually now added um, an extra banner as a warning because so many people are now, uh, even journalists are now going to these uh, Corona preprints and they add, had to add this, this extra banner to say, okay, it's nice that it's up here so fast, but please watch out. This is a preprint that isn't uh, reviewed by somebody else. So even though it's a positive initiative, BioArchive itself could be abused by people that say, hey, I have proven that this homeopathic therapy works against uh, five people that I treated with the coronavirus. I mean, it could be up there today, uh, who knows. One angle on this and uh, a problem is the embargo problem that many publishers who um, publish today have 12 months or up to 24 months of uh, embargo. And there's a big um, initiative driven by the scientific funders called Plan S, which really wants to bring that embargo to zero for um, the work that they fund. So that's a really encouraging trend. Um, I don't know what the exact timeline will be, but uh, let's be optimistic that in the next five years, from all of the funders that are in Plan S, that we will see a zero embargo uh, uh, dates. So the next step is that I will bring this to kind of my world and to uh, show you a little bit about the role of institutions and what they do with their institutional repositories in uh, this field. By the way, I've heard the word repository mentioned so many different times today, all with different definitions, is that I will try to say institutional repository and with and what I exactly mean by that is for example um, in the example of uh, student thesis is that um, a very famous repository is uh, Apollo from Cambridge and um, when they decided to put Stephen Hawking's thesis up there I think it's last year or two years ago they got so many downloads that uh, their DSpace repository uh, 
wasn't able to survive the load those first days. But today, if you go to it, you can, you can access uh, the thesis there together with the supplementary files. So this is, might have different colors. This is a typical DSpace repository where you can find the publications and the associated metadata uh, accessible for anyone. And it doesn't stop at academia. So if you uh, follow the news, I think it was uh, last week, you have the annual uh, recurring report from Oxfam who report on uh, inequality. Um, and they as well, even though they, it's a different model where they write the papers without any involvement from, uh, from publishing or review, uh, they also put those PDFs and, and their metadata into, uh, into the space repository. It also doesn't stop at PDF or text-based materials. An example from the University of Exeter, um, I could open it up, but if you click that little view more button, then you can scroll for half a minute down because this is actually one item that has 20 terabytes of data all packaged up into zip files of uh, 17 gigabytes. So if you put some storage solution under there, there is actually no um, theoretical limit as to how many how much data you can refer. Of course, the upload challenge, getting it in there or the download is, is another story, but these 17 gigabyte uh, packages seem to, seem to work pretty well. So the three examples before were all situations where the materials that are there are openly and accessible for download, but unfortunately, because of, of course, the academic privilege uh, linked to high impact journals, it's still the case that the libraries who operate these repositories are still tied to the situation that their staff can also publish in, um, in journals that have embargoes. So for example, here HZI in Germany, they um, tend to submit the items and the, the PDFs as soon as possible. And you can see um, the embargo dates that are on there. So it's not just so you can go in your Google Calendar and say, aha, in November 2020, I will go back to the repository and I will get uh, the paper. No. If you click on the download button, you get to the request a copy feature. And the request a copy feature is um, a technical feature around uh, a privilege in academia that you as an individual researcher, wherever you have published, you can always share uh, your work in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion with your, with your peers. So even though it's now a little bit more automated that, okay, I can say I want access for a reason X or Y, it still requires an individual to say, yes, you get, you get this copy, but it's a very, very effective way to just, uh, to just make sure that the metadata and the title and everything gets out there and that if you press the button, wait a few days, you have a copy anyway, even though there's an embargo until November. So I've showed you re different repositories and their, and their URLs. And the best thing is that um, you as an interested user, you don't need to know these sites. You don't even need to know that they exist because um, in the development of the DSpace project and also other repositories out there, we have very good relations with uh, Google Scholar who, does, um, who gives us a very hard job actually to keep our uh, systems up for them constantly hitting them with uh, crawler traffic. But that's, of course, to make sure that they can reference the, both the metadata as well as the direct PDF links in Google Scholar. So if the system completely works, you just get the PDF straight from Google Scholar, uh, completely oblivious that there is such a thing as institutional repositories that do all of this for you. So a little bit of history on the DSpace project and one of the reasons that I tried to submit uh, to, this, uh, to this day today is that... I don't know why he does that. Ah, uh, it's back. So normally if it works you shouldn't touch it, but I need to touch it to <laughs> advance the slides is that um, a as a community of uh, over 12 years old, um, some of the original committers have moved on. It's like any project, uh, everybody needs developers and contributors. So if you have some experience in Java or in Angular now, and if you hear something that is of interest, you're always welcome to, uh, to join. But um, the reason why DSpace today is the most successful um, institutional repository platform 
is in my opinion because i i don't know maybe it was all just uh, pure luck is the fact that it had localization support very early in the process so today we have there's a fork in china called uh, c space um, there is a whole range of installed repositories in taiwan uh, based of that localization support and of course the mit licensing that uh, that allows anybody to just do whatever they want with uh, with the software I'm gonna go a little bit faster because I see that I only have uh, five minutes left. I don't know where all that time went. Mm -hmm. um, but um, to talk about the DSpace 7 version and where we're going is, and also maybe as a learning of a project that is 10 years further and um, a little bit in feedback to Antonin's question like, yeah, how, how do we tackle with evolution of the platform and, and what do we allow is that it, there used to be a tradition of time-based releases in DSpace where basically any contributor could contribute or suggest something before a feature freeze deadline. And if it didn't break other features and if it was generally perceived as a good idea or, or not being in the way of somebody, any um, contribution could just get in there. So we started off in 2002 with one UI until um, Texas A&M University in the US decided, well, JSPUI, it's kind of getting old technology by now and we want to have something that can make, uh, can give specific look and feel on, on specific collections. So they came up with a new UI and it got accepted into the main line. But the problem at that point was there was not 100% feature parity with the old UI. So it had interesting features, but it was not convincing enough for the entire community to say, JSPUI, all of our customizations in the trash. So the, the bad thing that, well, the bad thing, it's, it's bad or good, uh, the, depends on how you look at it, is that since that point, the DSpace project has actually split its community into two, um, XML UI community and the JSP UI community. And I personally believe that's a bad thing because um, two groups of people that deal with the same problem space have been working on creating the same features or, or dealing with the same problems into these two, uh, two different UIs. So that's why um, the new attempt on uh, unifying these UIs also on a technology that is more modern and, and geared towards the future is that everybody was really on the same um, page of we really want to create something that can replace the two of them for the entire community and not just create a third UI where we will have our community split up into three different uh, different groups. So that's also the reason why this has been a quite lengthy process if you see the timeline and that we went in 2016 through a formal UI prototyping challenge where stakeholders in the community could say, we're fans of this technology, here are the use cases that we can build and demonstrate. And then we, uh, we as, a, as a company, we contributed a prototype on uh, Ember, but uh, we, we joined in the discourse with the community and, and we all aligned together on uh, another technology. So we threw away our own uh, prototype in Ember and we aligned on the fact that we were all gonna build this on uh, Angular uh, DSpace 7 together. So right now we're already on more code commits than some of the previous major releases combined and we are really in this final stretch to, uh, uh, to get to the end. And there is one video here that I, if it works, that I can just show you a bit of the uh, search feature. If I know how to put it full screen. is basically like the, the whole approach towards faceted searching in metadata is um, made a lot more responsive thanks to the fact that with, uh, with Angular we can break it up into all of these individual components and that they can get their data individually instead of always relying on uh, more page loads to, uh, to bring this data in. And maybe as a final thing and uh, hooking on to the story of the neuroscience um, uh, presentations in the morning is that one big evolution that we're bringing here is that instead of the rigid model of having metadata and a few objects that represent a paper or a data set, DSpace 7 will also have uh, rich entities to kind of um, make an entity model 
of anything that makes uh, sense in, in your context. So when we think about that uh, data lad that we saw this morning where it's like, okay, we want data sets and files or some of these other uh, neuro examples where it was a more intricate structure is that we'll be able to build that whole uh, representation of entities in, in DSpace 7, which is something that we're uh, very excited about. So thank you very much for your attention today. Yeah, so the question is um, what, uh, what definitions or the many definitions that are currently going around around open access, um, um, how we can get around that problem and, and about around that different understanding. And um, the major issue that I see with this is that actually some of the traditional publishers have co-opted the term of open access and uh, the fashion is that every year you add a new color or a new kind of substance in front of it. So you have green open access, gold, then you have diamond open access and whatever. And it's um, sometimes I feel like it's intentionally, intentionally made to, uh, to make it confusing and to, make, uh, to put commercial offerings in there that, uh, that, that seem like unique or a twist on some things. But it's really a different thing where you say a result is free, that you can just access a result or where you really have, uh, for example, text and data mining rights or uh, some kind of reproducibility or just that you, that you can do more than it just with, uh, except for only the basic readership. So um, I'm not sure if we will end up in a situation where there will be one agreed definition of open access. Maybe you just have to find a very original color. You can say this is pinkopenaccess.org, you make a website and you say, this is what it now means. And if you get enough traction, maybe pink open access is the future. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you have a feature in the uh, space seven to, um, um, to actually expose the bibliographic API for typically research lab websites where they want to provide the bi bibliography of their research, uh, researchers? Can you easily do that with uh, DSpace? Yeah. Um, the question is whether uh, DSpace 7 will have APIs so bibliographies can be easily integrated in other, uh, other websites. Uh, absolutely. So in past versions, we already had a REST API that allowed uh, this kind of uh, behavior. So getting the publications by collection or community or authors. But uh, we really decided that we want to eat our own dog food and that DSpace 7 has to be the new UI has to be a primary consumer of the REST API. So in DSpace 7, we are really exposing all of the business logic, including workflows, um, everything that you can imagine, the statistics on the, on the downloads and everything. Everything is now also in the, in the web UI, in, uh, so in the REST API. So everything that the REST API can do as an application, you could also kind of transfer to or, or other applications by calling the REST API yourself. I have uh, absolutely no idea why the software is called DSpace. Uh, it's just a name, but the funny, if you really go back in history, there's another uh, package coming out of the University of Southampton called uh, ePrints. So in the beginning, ePrints and DSpace were the two competitors, and it's actually the, the same uh, uh, software developer, and now his name just escapes me. The same person was at the, at the start of uh, both of them. Uh, Rob, uh, uh, I will, yeah, I will add it to my page somewhere later.
Thank you very much.